All right, so the other day we introduced body plots. We talked about their significance with respect to controls and why we care about them in controls. I gave you two basic reasons. I said the first is that time domain design constraints, meaning things like percent overshoot or rise time or time to peak, etc., can be related to different frequency domain constraints. And design in the frequency domain very often becomes easier than design in the time domain. <coughs> and that's something that we'll explore later in the semester. We're not really ready to sort of explore that yet. Okay. Now, when I talk about that, I mean things like, okay, the rise time for a unit step, for instance, the rise time of a response to a unit step, which is related to tau, is inversely related to the bandwidth, right? And so there's a direct relationship between tau and the bandwidth that I can use. In a second order system, right, we said, okay, well, if zeta gets smaller, that means that MP gets bigger and percent overshoot get bigger. So there's a frequency domain constraint and a percent overshoot constraint that are directly related. Similarly, right, I said time to peak and omega n are related, so is uh, rise time and omega n. So as omega n gets bigger, time to peak gets smaller, rise time gets smaller. All right, so we can use those later on, and we will uh, when we're designing. All right, the other thing is that stability uh, can be easily predicted from Bode plots, right? So if I want, uh, if I want to have, you know, a closed loop system, so I have a closed loop system here with unity gain, and I said the closed loop transfer function is L over one plus L. Well, when one plus L equals zero or L equals minus one, I said this point here is really sort of the verge of instability All right that's the point at which we reach the verge of instability so the way I looked at this okay so here is an example right so I said let's say I had a second order system and I let zeta equal to zero if zeta equals to zero the middle term goes away and I simply get this All right I can factor that guy like this I said well, what happens if I look at the frequency s equals j omega n. Well, at that particular point, what I see is the magnitude of this guy goes to infinity, okay? The magnitude of this guy goes to infinity, and the angle goes to minus 180. When the magnitude of this guy goes to infinity, right? What we are saying is, so the magnitude goes to infinity because the numerator went to, the denominator went to zero. What happens at that particular point is my poles sit on the imaginary axis and I start to get an oscillation. If they go any further, I get something to grow. All right. So what that says is, okay, so here in my closed loop transfer function, when one plus L just equals zero, that's where I get that same onset of instability, right? In this case, that means analyzing where L is equal to minus one, or what that means in the Bode sense is the magnitude of L is one, or the angle of L is equal to plus minus 180. And you'll see, we're gonna talk a lot more about the, the minus 180 than we do about the plus 180, okay? All right, so more to come later in the semester about all of that. All right, but let's talk about how we make those Bode diagrams. Now, I alluded to this the other day. So for this, what I've shown is for a transfer function h of s equal 1 over tau s plus 1, a single pole system. What I've shown here is a what we call a log, log plot. And what I've shown over here is a linear plot. Now, what I left with, when I say linear, right, I, I have a linear uh, x-axis and a linear y-axis. If I look at this magnitude, it looks looks sort of like a 1 over omega, 1 over x kind of look to it. Nothing particularly useful to it, right? I can't see any real features other than the fact that this guy just sort of falls. When I plot on the logarithmic scale, right, this log-log scale, what I see is I have a period where the magnitude is approximately flat, and then I have a period where it falls, and it falls, it looks like, at a rate of 20 dB, all right, a factor of 20 for every factor of 10 in frequency. So I get this sort of zoomed out look, all right, that allows me to see certain features that I don't see on a linear scale. 
That's one reason why we use the logarithmic scales with Bode plots. And you should have seen that at some point. All right. The other reason, which we'll see, is because when I use the log plot and I have a really complicated transfer function, so in other words, not one like this where I have a single pole, but one where I have many poles and many zeros, when I use the logarithmic scale, what I can do is I can look at each individual pole or zero. I can look at its effects individually and then add them up. Okay. Now, in an old school sense, that's, that's the way that it's, it's useful to draw Bode plots. Nowadays, of course, it's very easy to, you know, use MATLAB to draw a Bode plot. You don't really need to do it by hand. That said, I, I still think it's particularly important to have a good intuition about what a pole or a zero does. Okay. If you understand what a pole or a zero does in the frequency domain, then you can understand very carefully how to design a control system to achieve a particular set of performance characteristics. All right. So it's important to have some intuition, not just about the magnitude, but also about the phase. Phase is very key in control systems. All right, so we're going to go through how to do that here today. All right, now I want to recall here sort of our basic uh, form, if you will, of the, of the transfer function. This is the basic form that I am going to use. All right, and so in this case, remember H of S is a Laplace transform and S in general is a complex number which has a real part and an imaginary part, okay? So what I'm looking at here is a Laplace transform of something, of some system, all right? And uh, I'm looking at what is its um, Laplace transform, okay? And no matter what, I can always factor this guy into this sort of form where what I have is terms up at the, in the numerator, terms in the denominator, and, and then I have these sort of leftover terms here. These things that I call poles or zeros at the origin. And then I have this sort of constant here. That constant I often term a DC gain. All right, so just to, to sort of define some things here, so I have poles and I have zeros, okay? So poles are values of S where H of S is infinite, okay? So this is where the denominator equals zero. Zeros are values of S where h of s is exactly equal to zero. So this is where the numerator equals zero. All right, now again, I kept this as s equal to sigma plus j omega, all right, because very often we have real poles and zeros. So, so as an example here, all right, in this particular case, all right, if I have my poles here, my poles, I see that my numerator equals zero wherever s equals minus 1 over tau p1, right? If I plug that in to the transfer function, this numerator would be, or the denominator would become 0, and the value of the transfer function should go to infinity. Similar for this guy. I should have s equals minus 1 over tau p2, right? Denominator would go to 0. This guy would go to infinity. The zeros of this guy, the numerator would go to 0, and the transfer function value would go to 0. That happens when s equals negative 1 over tau z1 or s equal negative 1 over tau z2. Okay, so those are just our definitions of poles and zeros. Now this term in front here, I sum is, is really just a constant. Okay. Sometimes call it a DC gain. Okay. The reason I call it a DC gain is because if there are no poles or zeros at the origin, if this term doesn't exist, right, this will correspond to the gain of the transfer function of dc. So I often use that term dc gain, but it's really just a constant, okay? Now this guy here, okay, this guy is what we call poles or zeros at the origin. 
right? And we say that we have n poles or zeros at the origin. So in this case, if n is greater than zero, I have n zeros at the origin. If n is less than zero, I have n poles at the origin, okay? Now, um, when I say at the origin, meaning at s equal to zero, right? So, so the origin meaning s equals zero plus j zero, right, where that happens. Now, again, this is all in terms of s, the Laplace transform, okay? And I, I do it that way on purpose. The reason I do it that way, right, I want to go and look at this picture. So here, what I've done is I said, well, h of s is equal to 1 over, in this case, s plus 1. So this guy has no zeros, <clears throat> and he has one pole at s equal to minus 1. So at the pole, we said the value of the magnitude should go to infinity. Okay. So just to be clear, what I've drawn here is h of s, which is the magnitude of ah, magnitude of in this case just to be just to be totally clear we'll do it this way the magnitude of sigma plus j omega plus one like that which would be okay sigma plus one squared plus omega squared that is what I have shown you <clears throat> okay that's what this big surface is, okay? So I plotted it for different values of sigma, which I have here on my x-axis, and omega, which I have here on my y-axis, right? My z-axis, which I haven't labeled, is the magnitude of h of s, okay? So I can see right here where s equals minus 1, so this is my sigma value, s equals minus 1. So at this point right here, j omega is 0. The real part is minus 1. At that point, the value of that transfer function goes to infinity, just as it should. Okay, if omega equals 0, sigma equal minus 1, this guy should go to infinity, and that's what I have. This whole surface here, all right, is a plot of h of s, the magnitude of h of s, for all the different values in sigma and omega. All right, and what I see is I truly do go to infinity at that point. Now, what I see here right, this little red line, basically, I've drawn this red line, it's basically a cross section, it's the value along that surface when sigma equals zero, okay, in other words, this guy is h of s evaluated when s simply equals j omega, okay, this guy is what we call the Bode plot, Right? So I think it's important to see how the actual values of the poles and zeros relate to what that Bode plot is. Okay. All right. Um, what I can see here, oh, what I can see here that's really important is okay, when omega equals zero, okay, I can see that I'm sort of at the peak right here on this ridge. And then as frequency increases, I drop away. Okay. If you look at the shape of that, right, so omega equal to zero, and then as I head off towards infinity, omega equal to zero, I'm at a maximum, and then I drop off. Well, that looks a lot like what this looks like, right? Here's, here, this is really the value of that cross section right here, okay? And I can see what that looks like. So this would be that cross section for a particular uh, first order type of transfer function, all right? So it, I just wanted to show that relationship between the true poles and zeros, which, which happen not on the j omega axis typically, and, and the way that we sketch the Bode plot. All right. All right, so the Bode plot sort of exists, I guess, along this uh, axis, sort of a cross section of the whole thing. Now, um, what I want to do, I guess, is kind of think about, okay, well, all right, so what we do is we say that this guy is, we evaluate the transfer function at s equal to j omega. That is where we put the Bode plot, okay? 
And again, the implication with this is when s equals j omega, right, we're talking about signals that are e to the j omega t, meaning we're talking about sine, cosine functions, okay? So, all right, we're gonna evaluate h of j omega, which means we plug in s equal to j omega at all those points. All right, now what I was trying to say here is that, okay, if I do that, right, if I plug in s equal to j omega, each of these terms, so the, the poles and zeros at the origin, the regular zeros, the regular poles, each of those are individual complex numbers, right? And, and so I can think of this thing as a complex number having a particular magnitude and a particular angle. Okay, I can also think of it as a real part. and an imaginary part, okay? In controls, we actually think of it both ways, okay? This stuff here ends up creating something for me called a polar plot, which we'll use later. And then this stuff over here creates for me what I call the Bode plot, okay? All right, now, a couple of important things that we're gonna see. If I take the magnitude all right, the important thing is, remember, these are each complex number. So I have the, the poles and zeros of the origin are complex numbers. This guy's a complex number. This guy's a complex number. All of them are complex numbers. All right, <clears throat> the important thing to remember is if I take the magnitude of the product of complex numbers, that becomes the product of the magnitudes. In other words, I can say, so if A, B, C, and D are individual complex numbers, I can say that the magnitude of that product is equal to A, the, so the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B divided by the magnitude of C times the magnitude of D, like that, okay? Now, I use that here, right? And I say that the magnitude of H is equal to, and I should be very careful, it's the magnitude of K times the magnitude of, of the uh, poles and zeros of the origin times the magnitude of this zero times the magnitude of this zero divided by the magnitude of this pole and the magnitude of this pole. And I have this dot, dot, dot there to sort of represent that, okay, maybe this is just sort of a, a portion of all of these, right? And the important thing to remember is for each individual one of these, right, for this guy, if I have a complex number, it's the real part squared, right? Plus the imaginary part squared. Sometimes people forget that with the imaginary part, I don't include the J, right? I just have the omega tau P1 like that, right? And it's obviously similar for the zeros, right? If I have this guy here, remember that's zero plus omega squared. So that's just gonna become omega. Uh, and then I have the plus minus and here, which I'll have to deal with in a minute. Now remember for K like this, he may be negative possibly. So the magnitude um, is just the absolute value, excuse me, of whatever that constant is. So, all right, if I apply that here, okay? So I apply that, basically what that says, okay? Is that the magnitude of H of J omega is equal to the, the product of the individual magnitudes. And again, I'll just make that like that. Now, <clears throat> what we typically do is we take the log of this expression, okay? The log of this expression, meaning that I take the log base 10 of the magnitude of H of J omega, right? I take the log base 10 of that, bring that up. Okay. Now, why do we do that? Well, let's see. So in particular, let's say again, I have a bunch of numbers, A times B divided by C times D. Okay. Now, let's say I take the log base 10 of that. All right. Now, you should remember that what that means is I can take the log base 10 of A plus the log base 10 of B. So first of all, if I have 
the log of a product, that is always equal to the sum of the logs. And if I have the log of a, of a quotient like this, I subtract log base 10 of C minus log base 10 of D. Now it looks like we're getting awfully complicated, right? I, I got this complicated expression, but this complicated expression is just the product of a bunch of stuff, right? And if I take the log of the product of a bunch of stuff, it basically becomes equal to the sum of the individual logs. That's going to become really important because what it says is if I know how to deal with any one of these individual terms in the logarithmic space, I can add up their effects individually. Okay, that becomes really important. All right, we'll, we'll look into that a little bit more as we go through. All right, so if I apply, if I take that log base 10 of both sides of this expression, I get this, right? Log base 10 of k. Now here, right, I took log base 10 of omega to the plus minus n power. If I do that, right, that becomes equal to, I bring down the exponent, right, and I get this, okay. And then I take log base 10 of my zero term minus log base 10 of my pole term, minus log base 10 of my other pole term. So just using that, that property of logarithms that I you know, laid out here, okay? So again, what I see is that if I know how to deal with any one of these terms in the logarithmic space, so if I know how to deal with this guy, if I know how to deal with this guy, if I know how to deal with this guy, I can combine their effects in the end, okay? That's particularly important. All right, that's part of the reason that we like to do this, and we'll look into that a little bit more. All right, that's how we deal with the magnitude. We're going to look at some examples um, as we go. All right, but let's take a look at the other piece of this, right? So if I go back to my original h of s, and remember, oftentimes I write it this way, but, you know, s, I am constraining myself to s equal to j omega. That is implied when I do the Bode plot, okay? If this guy is a complex number, as we suggest that he is, okay? So that says, if I have a complex number, all right, A, B, C, D, all right, if A, B, C, and D are all complex numbers, and I take the angle of that guy, that is the angle of A plus the angle of B minus the angle of C minus the angle of D. So I apply that property here to this guy, right? And I get that the angle of h of s has to be the angle of k plus or minus the angle of this guy. So a couple of things before we go too far on this, right? So I can see, first of all, this property was applied. Angle of the first term plus the angle of this term plus the angle of this term plus the angle of this term minus the angle of this term minus the angle of this term, right? You can see all of those located in here. Now, why do I say the angle of the constant? Well, remember, the constant k could be positive or negative, right? If I take the angle of k, it's equal to 0 degrees if k is greater than or equal to 0, and it's equal to plus or minus 180 if k is less than that, right? Now, similarly, if I have a pole or zero at the origin, let's say I have j omega. Well, technically that's zero plus j omega. So if I think about it, right, if this is sigma j omega, this is a vector that points straight up. That has an angle of 90 degrees. Similarly, if I have minus j omega, that's a vector that points straight down. That guy has an angle of negative 90 degrees. And again, I've kept this general, so I say n, I have n of these, right? So if I have n poles at the origin, so in this case, let's say I had two poles at the origin, I would have minus 2 times 90, so that would have minus 180. If I had two pole, two zeros at the origin, I would have plus 2 times 90, or plus 180, okay? All right, <clears throat> now, um, how do I get the angles of these guys? 
right? These two are easy, right? How do I get the angles of these guys? Well, if I have a complex number in general that is j omega tau z1 plus 1, and I take the angle of that guy, well, that is simply the arctangent of the imaginary part omega tau z1 divided by the real part, okay? I can do that for each of these terms, right? The only thing that changes for these poles is there's just a minus sign in front. Right, so that says this whole thing can be written as so, okay? So two <clears throat> important results for us thus far, okay? Basically what we see is that the angle of the overall transfer function is the sum of the angles of each individual pole and zero component, okay? Similarly, we see that in the logarithmic space, the log of the magnitude is equal to the logs of the individual pole and zero components. So what that says is if I know how to deal with any one individual pole or zero component, I can plot the magnitude of the whole thing, right? And I can just look at each one individually, right? Look at each pole or zero piece individually and then add its components up to get the overall transfer function, okay? Now, one thing I'm gonna use in sort of the next part of this is I'm gonna say, well, oftentimes, for reasons I don't wanna talk about, it's sort of historic, right? We talk about 20 logs, so I you know, typically just multiply everything in here by, by 20, all right? And that's just sort of the units thing. I'm not gonna talk about it too much, but the same thing still applies, okay? All right. So in the log space, the magnitudes can each be looked at individually and added up. And the angles can always be looked at individually and added up. Okay? All right. Let's now start looking at some examples. 